Joining us for today's media briefing are Governor Tony Evers, DHS Secretary-designee Andrea Palm, Secretary Missy Hughes, the Chief Executive Officer of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, and available to answer questions, Dr. Ryan Westergaard, a Chief Medical Officer with the DHS Bureau of Communicable Disease, and Ryan Nilsestoon, the Chief Legal Counsel for the Governor's Office. We'll begin the briefing with remarks from Governor Tony Evers. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. It was a little more than a month ago that I declared a public health emergency on COVID-19. And folks, a lot has happened in the last month. We've been working around the clock to respond to and prevent the spread of COVID-19 in Wisconsin. And as I've said all along, we've been guided by science and public health experts to do what's best to keep our families, our neighbors, and our communities safe. It's a little more than three weeks ago now that I sat in this very chair and I asked for your help when I announced our Safer at Home order. I had met with business leaders and local health leaders and overwhelmingly we needed an all hands on deck approach to stopping the spread of COVID-19 in Wisconsin. Each and every one of us had to do our part to make sure that our healthcare workers and system didn't become overwhelmed by an influx of cases. I've said all hands on deck meant you too, and by golly folks, you delivered. From businesses like La Crosse's Distillery that started making hand sanitizer last month and is partnering with the Badger State Sheriff's Association to deliver hand sanitizer to every de sheriff's department in the state, to folks at the Allen Centennial Garden helping keep up the spirits of healthcare workers at UW Hospital, by donating hundreds of indoor plants from the greenhouse. To folks like Ashley from Monticello who donated her salon's supply of masks and disinfecting supplies to her local post office. And Larry from Austin, who is a diesel mechanic who's, st who's still working and making sure our truck drivers can get their goods to market. And educators who are still working to keep teaching, inspiring and empowering kids across our state like Mrs. Krieger from Mountain Bay Elementary, who reads a chapter from a book to her students every night. To the folks across Wisconsin who are picking up groceries for their neighbors, disinfecting hospitals and doctor, doctor's offices so they're safe for healthcare workers and their patients, running childcare centers, stocking the grocery store shelves, and making food so our restaurants can keep their doors open and to the untold stories of folks across our state who are making sacrifices, who are trying to make ends meet, who are doing their best to get by, who've kept their families, their neighbors, and their communities healthy by staying safer at home. A few weeks ago, we had a pretty grim outlook for what COVID-19 could mean for our state. According to the model created by the Department of Health Services, Wisconsin was projected to have between 440 and 1,500 deaths from COVID-19 by April 8th. But Safer at Home is working, folks, and it's because of all of you that we are where we are today. In the first three months of Safer at Home, our data shows that we have saved at least 300 lives and perhaps as many as 1,400 lives. We have helped flatten the curve, which has resulted in fewer cases and hospitalizations. And folks, we've saved lives together. But as I said all along, I'm going to rely on the science and public health experts to help us guide us through these challenges. Because at the end of the day, my bottom line is keeping people safe. And we're not out, just, uh, we're not out of the clear just yet. COVID-19 has been and still is a situation that sometimes changes by the hour. And that's why just as I did three weeks ago, today I'm asking for your help. Earlier today, we announced that K through 12 schools will remain closed for the remainder of the school year. And we are extending our safer at home order until May 26th. And I need all of you to continue doing the good work you've been doing so we can keep our families, our neighbors and our communities safe and so that we can continue flattening that curve so our healthcare workers and system can continue saving lives. Our new Safer at Home order includes the important protections that are keeping people safe, but it also includes some new flexibilities. 
This order will allow businesses new opportunities to serve customers, including deliveries and curbside pickup, while keeping their workers and customers safe. We're making it safer to shop at large retailers by implementing social distancing at stores like Target and Fleet Farm. Craft stores will be able to more easily get folks materials they need to make their own face masks and coverings. We're also allowing people to pick up the latest novel or children's books from their local library through curbside pickup. And with the weather hopefully starting to warm up, you'll now be able to get outside and play a round of golf with some common sense restrictions. You can still get to take out to take get out to take a walk, go for a bike ride, or walk the dogs. It's good exercise and it's good for everybody's mental health. But please don't take any unnecessary trips and limit your travel to essential needs like going to the doctor, grabbing groceries, or getting medication. Now, I know a lot of folks are concerned about the effects this will have on workers and businesses across our state. And believe me, no one wants to reopen our economy as much as I do. But the bottom line is that our businesses, our workers, and us as consumers can't be confident if we're not confident about our safety and our health. We can't think of this like flipping a light switch. It's like turning a dial. The more disciplined we are now, the faster we can turn it. Now, I want to be honest with you folks. Things won't get back to normal until there's a vaccine and treatment for this disease. And even then, our new normal will not be the same as our old normal. This will be a slow and gradual process. Let me be clear, this will not be like turning off a switch, but rather a dial that we can, we can turn to ramp down safer at home so that we can safely get back to our way of life. However, we know what we need to do to move forward. Our team at the State Emergency Operations Center has been hard at work developing a plan that will allow us to safely reopen our economy. I've been talking with business leaders and entrepreneurs, and so have members of my cabinet. I've also been communicating with governors around the country, particularly our neighbors in the Midwest. Here in the Midwest, we are bound by our commitment to our people and the community. We recognize that our economies are all reliant on each other, and we must work together to safely reopen them so hardworking people can get back to work and businesses can get back on their feet. Earlier today, I joined a bipartisan co coalition of governors in announcing that the states of Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana will work in close coordination to reopen our economies in a way that prioritizes workers' health. Our number one priority when analyzing when best to reopen our economy is the health and safety of our residents. We will make decisions based on facts, science, and recommendations from experts in healthcare, business, labor, and education. Phasing in sectors of our economy will be most effective when we work together as a, as, as a region. This doesn't mean our economy will reopen all at once or that every state will take the same steps at the same time, but close coordination will ensure we get this right. Over time, people will go back to work, restaurants will, will reopen, and things will get back to normal. Moving forward, we know that businesses need some clarity so that they can begin to plan. How can they make their customers feel safe? How can they make their businesses safe for their employees? And how can they implement appropriate social distancing? Well, here's how we'll do it. First, we need a massive expansion of our testing capacity. We've been steadily increasing our testing capacity for weeks and private labs and more private labs continue to come online. That capacity will need to increase significantly. This will require us building our existing strong public-private partnerships that will serve all of Wisconsin. In order to support a dramatic increase in te testing capacity, we will also need to grow our healthcare workforce and have sufficient personal protective equipment to ensure our workers are safe. We also need PPE for many of our critical workers to safely do their jobs. Right now, despite our state's ongoing efforts to get our fair share 
of supplies from the federal government, our successful PPE donation and buyback programs, and our aggressive procurement efforts, we still do not have enough PPP to keep all our workers safe, which is why we're working with health systems and businesses to implement decontamination strategies of our existing PPE so that we can safely bolster the supplies we have. So as we work towards safely reopening our economy, we're going to need a lot more PPE. The state continues to pursue this equipment through every avenue. Our members of Congress are great partners in pushing the federal government to do its part, and some Wisconsin businesses are already stepping up to help manufacture these supplies. In addition to expanding our testing capacity and acquiring more PPE, we will need to greatly expand our contact tracing efforts around the state. Once we've identified someone who is infected, it is imperative that we find out where they have been and who else they may have exposed. The more folks stay safer at home, the easier it is for our public health officers to trace their steps and contact others they have been in contact with. But when we're dealing with situations where someone who is sick has been in contact with dozens of other people in several different settings over a course of a week or more, it is much more of a challenge to track down everyone who might have been exposed. Contact tracing can be difficult and time-consuming work, but it is an essential program and uh, a component of our plan to safely reopen our economy when the science tells us the time is right. These major components, more tests, more PPE, contact tracing, along with daily analysis of the scientific data, will be the metrics that guide us going forward. At the end of the day, we have to remember we're all in this together, folks. And while we may, may not be all in the same boat, we're all weathering the same storm. So thank you for the work you've been doing by staying safer at home. And let's keep up the good work, Wisconsin. And with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Andrea Palm. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, as usual, uh, for joining us again today um, and for taking uh, these important steps uh, to continue to keep uh, Wisconsin uh, safer at home. Uh, safer at home is working. Uh, by working together as a state and following physical distancing guidelines, we have already saved lives. As the governor said, according to our modeling, in the first three weeks, Safer at Home has saved at least 300 lives and perhaps as many as 1,400 lives. We can continue to save lives by using Safer at Home. Together, we're flattening the curve. Together, we are supporting our healthcare workers by not overwhelming the hospital system. Together, we have saved lives, and together, we will save more. The data tells us that Safer at Home is working, and the science of the virus tells us what the path ahead needs to look like. By taking key steps in the next three week, excuse me, in the next weeks and months, we will be able to reduce the likelihood of a future surge in COVID-19 cases and deaths. Instead, by taking these steps, we will continue to save lives and to build our healthcare capacity so that starting to turn the dial on Safer at Home is a safe step to take. Over the next month, while we remain safer at home, we here at the state, uh, res statewide response will continue to build on the progress we've made with our partners in healthcare, the private sector, business, and local communities to keep Wisconsin safe. First, as the governor mentions, we need to continue to dramatically increase testing. This means we need to not only build more lab capacity and acquire more testing supplies, but it also means we need to obtain more personal protective equipment to make administering these tests safe. In a little over a month, thanks to a public-private partnership with Wisconsin biotech companies, we have already increased lab capacity from 500 to almost 7,000 tests a day. But we are still not testing enough to facilitate the kind of contact tracing we'll need to do moving forward or to know, or to know the true prevalence of COVID-19 in Wisconsin. We need a clearer picture of the situation, and the only way to take that picture is to further scale up our testing capacity. This is a critical and fundamental tool as we work to get to the next phase of our response. But testing isn't enough. Just knowing that the virus exists in a community, that's only the start. 
Once positive cases are identified, we must engage in contact tracing. Contact tracing involves interviewing every person who tests positive for COVID-19 to determine who else may have been exposed to the virus and then following up with those people so that they can take steps to quarantine or self-isolate. We have begun this work, but we will need a more robust system to put Wisconsin in a position to be able to actively and aggressively manage this virus until we have a vaccine or effective medical intervention. By identifying potential cases and then containing the spread, we will reduce the number of people infected and continue to protect our frontline healthcare workers, the healthcare system, and to save lives. But we also need to make sure we have safe spaces for isolation and quarantine to make that possible. The good news is that what we're doing, breaking the cycle of virus transmission through staying safer at home is working, which means we know what we must continue to do. The bottom line is that COVID-19 is a highly contagious virus that can infect people even if the level of exposure is low and can transmit even if the infected person is not showing any symptoms. Its high infection rate means that it travels easily between people and because people travel easily between geographic areas, the virus can spread easily between communities. There is no medicine for COVID-19 and there is no vaccine. So it is up to us to continue to work together to stop transmission and slow the spread. And we do that by staying safer at home. So here's where things stand today. We've got 29 active labs running COVID-19 tests in Wisconsin with a daily lab capacity of 7,578 tests. We have 40,974 negative tests, uh, which is an increase of 1,648 over yesterday. Uh, we have no additional counties reporting cases for the first time. And there are now 3,875 confirmed cases of COVID-19, which is an increase of 154 cases over yesterday. Our number of COVID-19 hospitalizations is 1,121, which is an increase of 30 patients. And that means that 28% of people who have tested positive for COVID-19 in Wisconsin have been hospitalized. Our total death uh, has now reached 197 Wisconsinites. Before we start to turn the dial on safer at home, further expanding testing and more robust public health containment measures must be in place. These steps will help us reduce the risk of a second wave of the virus. If we open up too soon, we risk overwhelming our hospitals and requiring more drastic physical distancing measures again. Extending Safer at Home will give Wisconsin the time to finish building up the tools we need to actively manage the virus and begin our return to a new normal. We can't change the fact that this virus is highly contagious, but we can stay home so it doesn't have the chance to infect us. We can't change the fact that there are no effective medicines and no vaccine, but we can stay home long enough for our hospitals to build enough capacity to treat people who need it. We need everyone's help to do this. At DHS and through our statewide response, we are doing the work to prepare our state and to take the steps we need to ease safer at home. But we cannot do this work without partners in the community. We're partnering with the labs and the healthcare system, with local governments and businesses large and small. And we cannot do this work without you. We know this is hard. And what we are asking you to do disrupts your everyday life, your ability to see family and friends, your ability to work and to make ends meet. But this is what we need to do to save lives. We are so thankful for the incredible and life-saving work our frontline healthcare workers are already doing. They are going to work for us. We need to stay home for them. We need you to stay safer at home a little longer, to take only essential trips a little longer, and to continue to follow quarantine and self-isolation guidance. Together we can protect each other, and together we can get through this. Thank you, Wisconsin, for all the work you have done and all the work you continue to do. And with that, I will turn it over to Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation CEO, Missy Hughes. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Evers and Secretary Palm for your leadership and difficult discuss decisions and for allowing me to join here today. So obviously the extension of the Safer at Home order is a continued challenge to the Wisconsin economy. There's been a lot of questions and discussions about when and how we might reopen the economy and the governor and the secretary and many of us have been involved in those discussions and, and heard many of the questions. 
But I want to emphasize for you that a path has been laid out today that will lead us to reopening the economy. And that path has to include testing and PPE, contact trace tracing, and isolation. And we will continue to have to do these things and build these tools in the coming weeks, and this will have to stay in place until we have a vaccine. So I want to level set for a moment and talk about the impact of COVID-19 on Wisconsin's economy. And that impact has been tremendous. For me, the first moment that I saw a signal that this was going to impact Wisconsin's economy was back in January when I was meeting with a very large manufacturer who has thousands of employees in China. And at that time, they informed me that all of their employees in China were being told to stay at home and the factories were being closed. So really, that is the first moment that we understood that this was going to start to impact our economy. Weeks later, I was traveling in Mexico and had a chance to visit with the mission of uh, foreign affairs and talked with the minister there. And we talked about the opportunity that this presents to make sure that we have a diverse supply chain and how this is going to impact manufacturers both in Mexico and Wisconsin, where we have very strong trade relations. And finally, at the end of February, I was speaking with the Kenosha Area Business Alliance, and they raised the question, what does this mean? What's going to happen with COVID-19? So we've been watching this come at, uh, for some time now, but I would say that none of us foresaw the impact that this was going to have on the small restaurant in Ashland or the independent painter in Green Bay or the cancellation of our festivals and conferences for um, many, many different organizations. So this economic impact has swept across the state, and it's affected large and small businesses, performance venues, nonprofits and chambers. Everybody has borne the brunt of this virus. We've seen a 40% drop in restaurant sales and practically a 100% decrease in travel-related sales. So to give you a sense of what small business means in Wisconsin, I just wanna, I wanna share this with you. We have 50,000 small retailers, 44,000 small healthcare and social service providers, 23,000 arts and entertainment and recreation businesses, and over 17,000 small food and lodging businesses. All of these impact, uh, businesses have been impacted by the coronavirus. So at WEDC, in the last few weeks, we've really been focused on responding to this crisis as it hits Wisconsin. The first thing we did was stand up a small program, $5 million, that was accessible for businesses of 20 employees or less. It was a small effort to try to bridge the gap between the federal stimulus um, coming into, this, into the state and um, that moment. Uh, we also did work with the state to make sure we had the necessary designations in place for the Small Business Administration so that our businesses in Wisconsin could access the loans coming out of the Small Business Administration. And to date, the Small Business Administration has approved loans to nearly 32,000 Wisconsin businesses, totaling over more than $7.2 billion. And payments of these loans should begin to arrive within 10 days of approval. Now, we've heard today the news that the applications for that have been uh, postponed, but we'll be continuing to work with businesses throughout Wisconsin to be ready when those applications hopefully are able to be taken again. And I want to say that in Wisconsin um, and other rural states like us, there's been um, excellent ability to access the SBA loans. And that really comes from a strong relationship throughout our communities with our community banks and our credit unions and their abilities to step in and help the businesses. So we're very thankful for that. In addition at WEDC, we've been working to help businesses navigate the challenges of essential versus non-essential. And we've helped businesses to be able to understand where they fall in the safer at home order. And I wanna say that businesses have all wanted to do the right thing. They want to make the right choices. And that shows us why Safer at Home has been working, because so many Wisconsinites and so many Wisconsin businesses have been working to do the right thing. And finally, we've connected with many businesses and the State Emergency Operations Center to help with pivoting, as the governor mentioned, to creating hand san sanitizer or manufacturing PPE building emergency centers, and helping develop testing. We're so thankful for the strength of Wisconsin's manufacturers and businesses to step into this challenge with both feet and help us solve these problems. So as we move forward and we continue to hear these thoughts about when do we reopen the, the economy and what does that look like, we have work to do. 
at all of our workplaces, we need to be looking and understanding what is it going to be like to reintroduce employees into our workplace? What's it going to be like to have the public, customers, come into our workplace? And we need to be working, looking at our workflows and our workspaces and making sure that we've been able to adapt and include things like social distancing and protection and cleaning on a regular basis to make sure that as workers and customers come back into these workplaces, they feel confident and they want to participate in that business and be there. And so we need to be working on that now. Now is the time to be focused on that so that when we're ready, when we've done this work with these different paths of PPE and testing, we're ready to be able to open our doors and you know turn that dial to slowly let folks back in. But if we don't do that work now, if we don't do the work to analyze our businesses, we're really going to be behind, we'll fall back behind the curve and we'll need to um, then do the work. And, and customers won't be comfortable coming into your stores or sitting in your restaurants. Um, and employees will feel uncomfortable working there. So we really have to take the time now and we're, we're blessed to have this time, as, as crazy as that seems to be able to do that work now and be ready for that. And the, the small businesses, the healthcare workers, the teachers, all the frontline workers, they have taken the brunt of this and they deserve our doing the work to be able to help everybody get back to normal and get back to that place where we know and love where Wisconsin can be. So I'm very aware that Wisconsin businesses are going to need resources to reopen, whether it's building plexiglass walls to create that safe distance or buying inventory, you know, the coffee shop that needs to buy milk and pastries. There's resources needed for that. And so at WEDC, we're working to understand the federal resources that are available. We're working with the state to understand what resources we might be able to deploy here. And we will continue to do that. And I look forward to working with our federal offices, the governor and the legislature on that. So finally, we need to keep working and talking together. Over the last few weeks and the last many months, I've had the privilege of talking with many, many businesses and many economic development groups and regional groups all around the state. And those groups are coming together now and thinking about reopening also. We're, we're hearing about lots of groups that are taking on this task and thinking about it for their region or their industry or their sector. And we welcome that and we welcome those perspectives because by gaining all of those dif different perspectives, we can have a chance to really understand the challenges and find solutions together. And that's what we need to be doing together. We need to be continuing to think uh, smartly and strongly and act bravely as this comes forward. So I want to echo Governor Evers and Secretary Palm for and thanking you for all that you've done for Wisconsin. Let's go forward together. Thank you. We'll now open it up for questions. And a reminder to maintain audio quality. Keep your phones on mute until it's time to ask your question. And in the interest of time, please one question per reporter. We'll begin with Molly Beck from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Molly? Uh, thanks for taking this call. Uh, school districts and private schools are all handling this time out of the classroom differently. Some began virtual instruction immediately in March, and some are just now considering that. Um, Governor, what is the minimum amount of instruction districts and schools should be doing for the rest of the school year? Well, we are, as, as you may have heard, we're, we have closed. Uh, schools will not reopen the rest of the school year, so they will continue to, to do whatever they can to make sure that uh, uh, teachers are interacting with kids and that they're doing the best they can. I know it's not the ideal situation. Uh, and also, uh, in the last uh, piece of legislation that, the, that I signed yesterday in the, in the, legis in the Senate, and the assembly signed uh, signed off on the days before. There's some specific uh, um, uh, sp some specifics that that uh, the each school district will need to uh, uh, identify uh, what they've done, what they haven't done moving forward. So I have a better flavor of that. But uh, with this order, uh, the, there will not be school to, uh, for the rest of the school year. And frankly, that's not a huge surprise for folks. The, uh, and so we, we will work with the Department of Public Construction, but uh, uh, the map that uh, the, the recent bill that I signed that lays out will have a better feel for uh, what those expectations are. Thank you, Molly. Now to Mitchell Schmidt from the Wisconsin State Journal. Mitchell? Mr. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the call today. Um, so there's been some questions, I mean, obviously the order just came out, but some questions, the legality of extending the order. Um, and I was wondering if you might be able to just talk a little bit about that, kind of how this exists separate from the public health emergency. Sure, this is Ryan Elsa still, and I'd be happy to answer that. Um, I don't have concerns about the legality. I know some people have been, you know, made some observations, but I think it's important when looking at the safer at home order compared to the governor's public health emergency that they're really two separate and distinct things. The public health emergency was declared by the governor. It lasts for 60 days. It expires on May 12th. And what that public health emergency allowed is it, it allowed the, gave the governor additional powers in order to really help us ramp up the response to COVID-19. So for example, it allowed public, local public health authorities to be able to recoup certain expenses from the state. It also allowed the governor to suspend certain administrative rules and also allowed the governor to issue, issue some orders to protect personal security and property. By contrast, uh, DHS and Secretary Palm in particular have ongoing powers that are not dependent on a state of emergency. And those powers are always around because you know, one, it's very clear in statute, but then two, uh, communicable disease can pop up at any time. And so DHS has longstanding authority to be able to, for example, close businesses, close other types of gatherings whenever there is an outbreak of communicable disease, and also issue other emergency measures that are necessary to combat communicable disease like COVID-19. And so that's what Safer at Home is based on, is those ongoing uh, long-standing uh, permanent statutory powers is not dependent on the governor's uh, declaration of a public health emergency. Thank you, Mitchell. Now to Scott Bauer from Associated Press. Scott? Hi, thank you for doing this call. Um, governor, your order doesn't say anything about the May 12th, uh, 7th Congressional District Special Election. What is your intention with that? Are you still considering delaying or making other changes to that, or is that going to go ahead as scheduled currently? Um, I think I can also answer that question, Scott, for the governor. Um, so we're continuing to keep a close eye on it. You are correct that the order does not mention uh, the special election for the 7th Congressional District. Um, it's something that, just like with the spring election, we'll continue to listen to clerks in the down on the ground and also the public health officials. But I do think it's worth noting that there are some very distinct differences from the special election for the 7th um, compared to the spring election, which we just had. You know, among those are one is expected that there's going to be a much lower turnout for the 7th Congressional District. Two, it's in a much more rural part of the state, so you're not going to have the same types of issues like we saw with the spring election in terms of large numbers of people, hundreds of people going to the same polling place like you had in the spring election in our larger urban areas. Also, the 7th Congressional District has a lower rate overall of people who have tested positive for COVID-19. So while it's still definitely a concern, it's not at the same level of concern that we saw with the spring election in other parts of the state. And the final thing I think that's worth pointing out is that we've had a lot more time to prepare for the 7th Congressional uh, District race. The State Emergency Operations Center is working with the Wisconsin Elections Commission in order to provide supplies, provide PPE and other resources, and folks have had a lot more time in order to request an absentee ballot and get it submitted. So, you know, we'll continue to watch it closely. We'll continue to listen to the public health officials and our clerks in terms of what they're hearing, but I think there's some very significant differences between those two elections. Thank you, Scott. Now to Emily Fannin from WKOW-TV in Madison. Emily? Hi, thanks for taking this call. Um, my question is for the governor. Um, there's been some pushback from Republicans and business groups um, about your decision today to extend the stay-at-home order. What is your message to them? Well, it, it was clear in the 20 minutes I took to uh, uh, talk about this is that this will give us time to work with uh, uh, businesses across the state to prepare for reopening. Uh, we, I believe the, the at least the the business groups I've talked to and the businessmen and women I've talked to, uh, they, they care about safety as much as I do. And, uh, and they understand that in order for us to get to a point where reopening can happen on a, on a gradual, uh, thoughtful way, that we need to have more testing, we need to have more 
PPE. We need to have more contact tracing. We need to be able to pr provide that safety for the people of Wisconsin. If we don't do that, our, you know, first of all, we're not going to have workers that go to work, and second of all, we're not going to have people in the state of Wisconsin that feel comfortable about spending their money and increasing the economic growth of our state. So I understand the, their frustration, but this gives us all a chance to flatten the curve, make sure we, that we have these preconditions set in place that the, these several governors agreed on, and that will give time also for businesses to prepare what it's going to be like when they do reopen. And uh, it, it's, it's not going to be flipping a switch. It's going to be making sure that workers are safe, making sure that proper distancing is in, in place. Uh, this, this is not just, well, we did this before, now we're going to do it uh, going forward. We have business groups all across the state planning on, on this, and that this will give even more time to thoughtfully plan out and be ready. And also, just as just as an aside, and I did mention it, but you know, these making these things happen, we can dial back also our expectations. The the uh, the, the virus still uh, still drives a lot of decision making here, and if we're successful in getting these pieces in place that are absolutely important in order for us to reopen as a state. Uh, if we continue doing what we're doing, we may be in a position to do this earlier. It may be later. We will we'll work hard to make sure that we do it right. Thank you, Emily. Now to Bruce Marcus from WRJO Radio in Ashland. Bruce? Bruce Marcus? And a reminder, star six to unmute your phone. Bruce Marcus? Okay, we'll move on then to Casey Nelson from WTAQ-TV in Green Bay. Casey? Hi, thanks for taking the call. This one is for uh, pretty, uh, really anyone, I guess. Uh, but we've been talking a lot about the economy and bringing it back. And really, uh, even though the order has been pushed back to the 26th, when can we really start expecting to see these uh, expectations and things kind of start to roll back a little bit more. As I just said, uh, we are we've extended it to the 26th. In that time, we our our conditions that are really important that we don't sit here next year at this time talking about this is making sure that we have the testing uh, testing in place, massive testing for the people of Wisconsin to pre to keep them healthy the appropriate equipment to make that testing possible, the appropriate equipment that will help our businesses keep their workers safe, also the contact tracing, all those things have to be in place. And I can't sit here today and say it on, on March or May 26th at 4.30 in the afternoon, that's when it's going to be done. We're going to be working hard as hell as we can in the meantime to have these things done so that the planning that's going on in our businesses will continue to uh, you know, be prepared to reopen the state on a very gradual and thoughtful way. Thank you, Casey. Now to Dylan Brogan from Isthmus. Dylan? Dylan Brogan? Okay, we'll move on to Victor from CBS 58 in Milwaukee. Victor? you again for uh, taking the call. Um, as you said, that what's going to be needed in order to push us into a position to return to some sort of normalcy is going to be testing uh, and contact tracing. What's the status update on uh, what uh, systems, whether it's staffing, equipment, uh, to essentially prepare for um, when that will be needed and return to uh, the reopening, so to speak? Yeah, so um, during our uh, the first three weeks of Safer at Home, we certainly have been working uh, very hard understanding that these, these are priorities that are going to um, allow us uh, to move to the next phase of this response. And so we have um, uh, 
over the last month expanded our testing capacity um, from about 500 tests a day to, uh, to I think today's capacity was 7,500, yesterday's was about 7,800, um, uh, and we will need to continue to scale that um, much further. I think there are a variety of public health experts around the country uh, that are doing some really good thinking about this. We are looking at um, the ways they are um, recommending, uh, but we want to make sure we uh, are, are hitting, hitting the right um, um, the right capacity for the state of Wisconsin in the right way with the right strategy. So we are um, uh, we are currently um, in, in active planning around uh, building our testing capacity, but it has been a priority. We have made a lot of progress, uh, but we will continue to do that work over the next uh, four to five weeks for sure. Uh, on the contact tracing front, we, uh, as you know, have been pushing additional assets into that system. Uh, we've pushed about uh, 130 folks into contact tracing uh, and are training an additional about 50 this week uh, with, um, I think, about 75 additional recruits behind them in the pipeline to, to do training and get into the system. Um, and, and again, like with testing, there are a number of public health experts around the country who have who, who are thinking about and giving advice about how many contact tracers per thousand people in your state, et cetera. There are, there are you know, various models and formulas around how to think about this, and we are looking at recommendations and thinking again about what it needs to look like in the state of Wisconsin so that we are doing it right and thoughtfully and, and so that it meets the needs of our people and our specific circumstances here, and, and that is uh, also active, uh, very active and ongoing work uh, through the statewide response. Thank you, Victor. Now to Eric Gunn from Wisconsin Examiner. Eric? I'm sorry. Is it okay? This is Dylan Brogan from Isthmus. If I jump in, I'm sorry. I had a star six problem. Go ahead, Dylan, and then we'll, we'll go to Eric. Governor, there's a rally planned on April 24th from citizens uh, urging the state to reopen. Um, will orders your orders be enforced on that date? And do you have a response to citizens who are calling for the state to be reopened on April 24th? Well, our order uh, started today. So yes, it, it will be in place at that time. And uh, uh, the Capitol, uh, the Capitol and, and its grounds have been, um, been part of exercising the First Amendment rights uh, as long as I've been alive. And so uh, I'm sure if that happens, that it will happen again. Uh, we're encouraging people that uh, do come that they uh, use social distance uh, um, distances so that uh, they can remain healthy. Thank you, Dylan. Now to Eric Gunn from Wisconsin Examiner. Eric? Thank you for taking this, Google. Thank you for taking this. Uh, Governor Evers, when you signed the legislation the other day, you mentioned that you felt it was a, a start that was much more needed. Can you enumerate some of the specific things that you would like to see in subsequent uh, state legislation uh, responding to the COVID-19 situation? Yeah, and I, and I think uh, uh, Secretary Hughes uh, talked about this quite a bit. The, you know, we are blessed in the state of Wisconsin to have a highly diverse uh, set of work, not only workforce, but the businesses that uh, uh, drive our state economy. And um, we, we desperately will need some help in the arena of small businesses, whether it's uh, a business in Lincoln County where uh, you own a gas station and, uh, and, a, and a restaurant that's attached to that gas station. How are they gonna survive without uh, uh, some assistance from the state of Wisconsin. So we, we, I believe one of the top things for our consideration going forward as a state is, uh, is focusing on, on, our, on our smaller businesses. And also the ag economy struggled before this, uh, uh, this, this virus visited the state of Wisconsin and uh, continues to be a, a problem. Uh, I think the the state can add some value to uh, uh, farmers' back, back pockets to uh, help them get through this. And so those, those are two areas that I have a great concern. And I think uh, whatever we can do to help our small business owners of the state and those in our agriculture industry that are struggling, I think that, for me, would be a top priority for consideration. 
Thank you, Eric. Now to WAOW TV in Wausau. WAOW? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, Governor, actually, this is kind of a follow up to the question that was just asked. Um, we also have a uh, rap planned for this upcoming Sunday. And actually, some of our uh, local police captains in some of the smaller towns, or police chiefs, I should say, in some of our smaller towns have penned letters. Uh, to your office asking that, you know, the, this is obviously before you made the announcement, to lift the orders just because they're not really seeing anything in their counties or in their towns. Uh, what would you respond to those police chiefs? Well, they're, first of all, whether they have active uh, COVID-19 um, folks that uh, are in their towns or their, or their counties, there are very few that have uh, none, and none identified, but uh, the likelihood of every county in the state having uh, someone who is COVID positive is real strong. I mean, the, the ones that are being tested are, are somebody that have, most of them that have severe, uh, severe um, exhibiting severe uh, uh, disease, parts of the disease, respiratory issues. There's a bunch that uh, have none, and, but they're still, they're still able to pass it on. So to assume that you're having none in a county or very few in the county doesn't mean that's it. And second of all, the, um, even though there may be small numbers that have been identified, uh, the small, smaller, smaller counties and municipalities in, in, the, in the state also have the fewest resources. And so one spike in, uh, in, in one county it could be devastating, it could close down a, a, a small rural hospital in very few days. So we have to have a statewide approach here. And the fact that the sheriffs feel that uh, we should not do safer at, at home, uh, we're doing it exactly for them and for all people in Wisconsin. It's a comprehensive approach. We have to make sure that uh, we continue to flatten the curve. Uh, we haven't even gotten there yet. And uh, so it, this is a statewide comprehensive plan and we, we can't just parcel out parts of the state. Uh, and, and leave them uh, high and dry. Now, if there's going to be a protest in central part of Wisconsin, or, or, and I think that was part of your question, the same response. First Amendment rights, you have to, vet, you have to make sure that uh, people have a right to do this, but it's also important that uh, uh, we're hopeful that they'll keep uh, um, a safe distance apart and they're doing the social distancing they need to do. Thank you. Now to Ben Meyer and WXPR Public Radio in Rhinelander. Ben? Good afternoon for either Secretary Palm or Dr. Westergaard. I noticed in the press release uh, today you took pains to point out um, a, uh, a suggestion, a very strong suggestion, that people not travel to cabins or second homes. Um, that's of particular interest to us here in the Northwoods. Is that a problem that you've been seeing or a particular concern? Uh, so I, we, we certainly have heard anecdotally um, uh, and, and have certainly heard concerns from communities that do have a lot of second home, um, you know, um, uh, residents. Uh, and so we think it's important for people to understand what we mean by essential and non-essential travel. And to the governor's point about small communities um, uh, traveling to your second home and bringing with you as a, as a potentially asymptomatic person or someone with mild symptoms, uh, you could have significant impacts on that community. And so uh, we, we did want to make sure we were being clear to encourage folks to stay home in their primary place of residence as, as much as possible. Did you? Okay. And I'll just jump in on that. I, I talked to uh, officials in northern Wisconsin regularly, and it is a top uh, uh, point of uh, uh, conversation for, for them and w with me. Uh, they're concerned about the uh, people coming in, certainly they're, uh, they're owners of their homes, likely, but the, uh, the uh, second homes, but the, the fact of the matter is, by them coming there, they're using resources that would normally uh, be used uh, for the people that live there, and if there's some, uh, some event uh, that uh, that happens that will take more resources from an area of the state that has few resources to uh, to spare. Thank you, Ben. Now to Addie Bink from WFRV in Green Bay. Addie. 
WFRV in Green Bay. Okay, Hi, we'll can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, I was just wondering, this might be for Governor Evers or for Secretary Palm, but is the state doing anything else uh, for people's mental health during this time besides resilient Wisconsin? This is certainly um, uh, a big concern for us and a top priority. I think uh, to your to your question about re resilient Wisconsin, that is a is a primary effort of ours to raise awareness, to help people, to help normalize, and people uh, understand that the stress and the isolation um, from this uh, pandemic and the need to be safer at home has significant implications for folks. Uh, and their mental health and emotional well-being, and that certainly uh, is is the case in spades for for people who are already suffering with behavioral health issues. And so you'll see in the order uh, as this this version and previously that we are very explicit about access to behavioral health, access to um, uh, uh, treatment, and the kind of supports and resources that folks who have. Uh, mental health issues, behavioral health issues, uh, to make sure that they can continue to have access to those as as an essential health service for for them and for their well-being. We will continue to bulk up uh, a resilient Wisconsin um, to make sure that we are responding uh, to the to needs that we're hearing about to um, to communities specifically or to particular kinds of populations. Right, I think. Uh, healthcare providers are a great example. Um, uh, they are, uh, in many ways, right now, first responders, which is not necessarily what they are used to being, and that's a level of stress and anxiety that that they that they have not potentially previously experienced. So, how are we thinking about resilient Wisconsin in a way that steps up to meet their needs in this very particular time? But we we certainly want to think um, more broadly about other populations, about other vulnerabilities. Uh, and make sure that we are meeting people's needs moving forward. Thank you, Addie. Now to Jessica Van Egren from Up North News. Jessica? Jessica from Up North News. Okay, we'll move on then to WISC TV in Madison. WISC? I'm going to remind our star six to. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry, a little tricky. Uh, this is for the governor. You've said consistently that these measures, part of safer at home, is to save lives. Still, we've seen people in the community resist this. We've already talked about some of the rallies that are planned for this weekend and for next week. Do you feel any frustration that there's this much pushback? No, no. Uh, there's a lot of... A lot of sacrifice that uh, we're asking and we're, we're getting from the vast, vast majority of people. I'm guessing many of the people that will be protesting have, uh, have uh, accomplished some social distancing over the last couple of weeks. So, no, it's not a frustration. It, it, clearly, when, um, when we're asking people to sacrifice in order to uh, uh, save lives and to make sure that uh, as a state we're uh, healthier, than, uh, than we are now. Um, some people may not uh, get the message and, uh, and basically f focus on uh, uh, what's being taken away. Uh, I just encourage people to understand that uh, if, we, if we isolate, if we stay at home, if we um, make sure we have social distancing, um, that you're saving lives and you're making, uh, making it shorter. Uh, the time that we spend in this uh, in this situation, but no, I'm. It, it, it doesn't frustrate me. First Amendment rights are really pretty cool, and I uh, I think it's a it's a good thing, um, and we'll continue to make the case that social distancing is uh, critical. And so, hopefully, when they're here or any place else in the state, that that's uh, uh, that's what's happening. Thank you. Now to Casey Cronus from Fox Six in Milwaukee, Casey. Hi, thank you for taking the call. Uh, healthcare workers undoubtedly will have a long road to recovery ahead. Some might be dealing with PTSD in the aftermath of this pandemic. Wondering if the state is putting any measures into place to ensure that those healthcare workers and first responders will be provided with immediate resources and counseling. Well, certainly, the, this is Governor Evers. Certainly, the last piece of legislation had 
some pieces that covered some workers on the, <coughs> excuse me, the issue of workers' compensation. Uh, but but we, we, we have to be prepared for uh, a longer haul on this. I mean, sometimes uh, the, uh, the stress and the trauma that occurs uh, plays out over a period of years, months and years. And so as a state, we, we have to be ready that uh, some of these uh, first line people uh, may need the help uh, that they've been giving to the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, positive folks. And so we will, we will continue to monitor that. We'll continue to make sure that we have the services available and, uh, and hopefully the, uh, the, the legislature and, and others will make sure that uh, adequate compensation is uh, in, in line for everybody. Thank you, Casey. Now to Catherine Keller from the Bayview Compass. Catherine? And a reminder, star six, to mute and unmute your phones. Catherine Keller? Okay, to Nicole Killian from CBS News. Nicole? CBS News, Nicole Killian? Okay, to WBAY-TV, Katie Anderson. Katie? Hi, can you? Okay. Um, my question is, uh, the relaxations that are included in this new order, do they take effect now, or do they take effect on April 24th? Uh, this is Ryan Nelson. They take effect April 24th. So the, the reason for announcing the extension and signing the extension now is to give folks time to prepare. Um, so the original Safer at Home order is in effect until um, next week, at which time the extension and the new provisions take effect. Thank you. To Jeremy Janine now from Urban Milwaukee. Jeremy? Thank you. Question for Secretary Palm. You mentioned testing capacity needs to grow to be able to do all the contact tracing and everything that needs to be done long-term. In the short run, why aren't we seeing more of the testing capacity being used if it's available? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and we are certainly working hard um, uh, to make sure that providers understand that there is capacity in the system, uh, that they have uh, uh, the ability to use their discretion to order a test for a patient that they believe needs to be tested, uh, that we are not uh, living in, in a world uh, where we need to be um, quite so restrictive about who can access tests now that we have this expanded capacity. And so uh, uh, we are certainly working hard to communicate with providers and healthcare systems uh, uh, to, to make sure that folks understand that so that they are um, uh, ordering uh, tests for folks who they believe need them. I think the other thing we are actively working on um, is, is this um, more strategic deployment of testing capacity, uh, uh, whether it's a, um, an outbreak at an employer, an outbreak at a long-term care facility, um, uh, uh, et cetera, so that we are um, really pushing those resources into a community when we're seeing a, a spike in cases to wrap around that um, potential spike and, uh, and, 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 and sort of put to use the resources we have to stop the spread as quickly and efficiently as possible. And so we are working to scale up both of those, both of those things as we continue to try to grow the overall capacity of the testing system. Okay, I, I, this is Ryan Westergaard. I think I'd add one more thing to that, that we, we, we do expect providers in, in routine settings and outpatient settings will be testing more patients for COVID-19 going forward, both because the capacity has increased, but also, um, as happens every time this year, influenza seems to be going away. So you know, about sometime in the spring, we, we do surveillance on influenza, as, which is a predominant cause of respiratory illness. And um, now, as it often does, the, the numbers have become really slow. Um, with influenza, so so the message that for for the for healthcare partners is that when we see acute respiratory illness, we need to much, have a much higher uh, index of suspicion for COVID-19. And now that the capacity is is better, it's it not, not only can they, but they should think about testing for COVID-19 in routine outpatient settings. And the, the the increased supply allows us to test people with mild symptoms, whereas before it was people with fever and severe symptoms requiring hospitalizations. That's going to be able to change a lot now because patients with um, with mild symptoms seen in the outpatient setting can also be tested. 
Thank you. Now to Kent Wayne Scott from WISN TV in Milwaukee. Kent? Hi. Uh, Governor, I want to ask you real quickly about your uh, order as it pertains to schools where social distancing may not be as easy as, as it is in a, in a business setting. Whether it's this summer or for the fall semester, before you allow students and teachers back into crowded classrooms or onto school buses, will your criteria for reopening schools be stricter than it is for businesses? Well, I, I think it's, it's difficult to say because uh, different businesses will have, uh, you know, look differently at, at the criteria. So I, I just think it's whether the people that, uh, people in Wisconsin feel comfortable with uh, sending their kids to school. And uh, that plays out in a lot of different ways. We have to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, everybody's ready to go back to school and uh, make sure that uh, our, our, by that time in, in the early fall, we have, we, we have to hope that the, this uh, virus has been uh, virtually eradicated uh, because schools not only have a lot of little kids in it, and I know little kids are less likely to uh, uh, have significant uh, issues with, uh, with the COVID-19, but the fact of the matter is each school is, is, uh, has multiple adults coming in and out, whether it's teachers, whether it's parents, whether it's people delivering uh, food, you name it. And so we, we, we will need to be uh, certain in our own mind that uh, uh, we have uh, virtually uh, moved back to, uh, back to a point where there's very few cases in the state and the few cases that we do have is, are being immediately uh, identified through massive testing and, and, and the contact tracing is in place. So a lot of the things that uh, the, the governors have talked about in these numbers of states that are doing it uh, play, play a huge role in whether schools will reopen this fall. Uh, there's certainly the hope that it will. Thank you, Kent. Now to Will Cushman from Wiscontext. Will? Welcome. Hi there. Hi there. My, my question is for, for the governor. Um, we're noticing in uh, this updated order that uh, golf courses will be allowed to reopen under a, a few conditions. Um, I'm wondering what has changed since the original uh, Safer at Home order um, that has prompted you to allow golf courses to reopen. I know that there has been a a fairly intense lobbying effort on their behalf. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that decision. Well, to me, it's a, a good example of, of uh, you know, there are uh, orders can be changed uh, during the life of, uh, uh, of, of an order, uh, various pieces. And so we're, whether it's a, a gazillion people writing in about golf courses or two people writing in about something else, our staff gives it full uh, full full uh, their full effort to analyze it and to see if it's something that has to be changed and after lots of conversation that, that's one that we decided to change and so uh, we're we're moving forward with uh, with that change it it, it shows I think I think that uh, we we understand that uh, reasonable solutions can be found uh, to uh, uh, solve some problems thank you will now to NBC 26 in Green Bay Hi, um, I'm just wondering, uh, where do you believe Wisconsin is at right now in terms of a peak? Have we hit a peak? Are we still approaching a peak? Where do you think things might be with that? Yeah, so we're, when the, we, don't, we don't necessarily, uh, are, we're not able to determine when a peak is until it's, it's passed. So what we can do is just look at the data coming in on an ongoing basis. And, and right now we're seeing a really steady, really a flat line in terms of the number of new cases being reported per day between 150, sometimes higher to a 190. Um, and so it's, uh, if we are at the peak, it's, um, it's, a, it's a slow spread out peak, which is exactly what we wanted to see. But we won't know for sure until we really see a sustained decline in the number of new cases. Um, the fact that it's, a, that it's a flat curve is actually really encouraging. That's really a sign of success because what infectious disease uh, epidemics tend to do is continue to go up. So as more people are infected, you expect 
a multiplying effect. So the fact that it's flat means that, that what we're doing is working. So if we hope, we hope to see that we start seeing fewer and fewer cases, but I don't think there's enough information in the next, in the last week or so to say that we're seeing a downward trend. So we really have to keep following it on a day-to-day you know, -day basis. Thank you. Now to Morgan Wolf from NBC 15 in Madison. Morgan? NBC 15? And a reminder, star six to unmute your phone. Morgan Wolf from NBC 15. Okay, moving on then to uh, Ryan Burke from Spectrum News One. Ryan? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, with schools now closed through the end of the school year, this is very likely to create some additional challenges for parents, particularly those who are essential workers uh, dealing with child care if they have to work themselves. Uh, how is the state continuing to address, address this issue uh, as we move forward with the order extended? Yeah, well, we've had great partnerships with several organizations uh, uh, since, this, uh, uh, since our efforts around the state on COVID-19 and uh, the Department of Children's and Families done a great job in uh, setting up new places and making sure that uh, uh, our, our workers that are working in these essential industries do have access to child care. We'd like to be able to uh, expand that. We're going to need, uh, need more resources to do that. Hopefully that'll be one of the things we talk about. Uh, either with the federal money or possibly state money. But the bottom line is, as we expand it, uh, uh, the, the, the need for child care will continue. It's a huge issue in our state, even when it's, uh, uh, we're not at facing this issue. So it's been compounded by uh, COVID-19. But I think we're in a good place right now. I, I, I know we could do better, but we need to uh, continue on uh, with the efforts with, that we have going right now. Thank you, Ryan. Now to Sean Kirkby from Wisconsin Health News. Sean? Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was wondering, so when the uh, states on the East Coast announced that they were forming a compact, they talked about creating a working group with members of with a public health and economic official from each state involved with it. Can you talk a little bit about how this compact the Midwest is going to work and how you plan to uh, closely coordinate? Is there going to be a similar work group? Thank you. Uh, whether it's a similar work group or, or some offspring of that, uh, it, it'll look pretty much the same. We have several states. Uh, uh, certainly the governors will be in communication with each other on a regular basis. We'll, we'll encourage others within our uh, organ similar organizations that may evolve into something, as you s suggest there, where uh, there's, uh, there's a handful of people in each state that uh, are together communicating with each other. But uh, I feel confident that uh, the fact that we had a bipartisan approach here, that uh, we will be uh, in a good place together to uh, take this on and uh, and make the uh, uh, make this make the efforts to move this forward, make sure that we have testing uh, the proper equipment, making sure that we have the contact uh, trace uh, tracing going on. As as we learn from each other, I think we will be in a position to uh, uh, have less mistakes. Thank you, Sean. Now to W O R T Radio in Madison. W O R T. Hi there. Hi there. Um, so my question has to do with this week's release bill, and um, I'm wondering what you would say, Governor Evers, to first responders who say there's a high burden for them to prove that they got COVID-19 while working um, in order to be covered by workers' compensation uh, to cover their illness. Well, uh, the... The piece of legislation, and I think we've, uh, I think as I remember, there were several first responders that uh, were um, not in that, uh, not included or was, was in there and, it was, and they were taken out of the bill. We, we will do whatever we can to make it fair that uh, workers' compensation is, uh, is provided to those, uh, those healthcare workers and those first responders and finding ways to make sure that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's in a, it's easy to um, make that happen. They're doing the hard work. We, we, need to give them a, we need to give them a hand if, if they are ill. 
Thank you. Now to TMJ4 in Milwaukee. Rachel? Rachel from TMJ4? Hi. Yes, we're here. I was just, we, we were wondering, you know, with so many people right now in our state unemployed and filing for unemployment, how are you guys working to make sure that people start receiving their unemployment as soon as possible? Because a lot of people in our area still haven't received that. Well, we've uh, expanded the uh, uh, the workforce uh, and, and moved people around within the department. We uh, we've we've actually, you know, with few exceptions, have done. You know, we had a couple uh, technology glitches uh, going forward or in the beginning, but uh, we've been receiving and uh, people. You know, some people are getting uh, getting their. I know there's thousands of people in Wisconsin that are getting their unemployment uh, insurance checks. Uh, we we will, we are working as hard as we can. We we had requests in for uh, for some more folks. Uh, I don't think that was a part of the the budget. So we'll just keep making do with, with the folks we have. But uh, the most important part of that legislation was eliminating that uh, uh, that first uh, week of uh, that people did not get their uh, unemployment insurance checks. And now that we're consistent with federal law, that will that will be the case. Uh, the ones that um, are, have not got them, then they should get back on the horn and talk to our people at the, at the uh, Department of Workforce Development and, and keep asking those questions. It's, it's not that uh, I think anybody's doing a bad job or deliberately doing a bad job. We're certainly doing the best job we can under the circumstances. And if people have not received their checks yet, then they should come back and uh, ask questions. Thank you, Rachel. Now do WLUK in Green Bay. W Thank you. This is Mark Leland at uh, WLUK. I was wondering, you know, some large events and festivals have already canceled into June and July, well beyond the Safer at Home order time frame that you set up now. Um, do you see a scenario at this point where group events would be possible at all this summer, whether they're graduation parties, fans at sporting events, or other types of gatherings? And, and what do you say to those trying to plan? Well, I'll, I'll give my kind of off-the-cuff comment, and then I'll let uh, Secretary Palm talk about this. But clearly, um, large groups of people, the odds are str stronger that the infection can be spread than if it's a small group of people. And so the idea that somehow um, large events happening uh, anytime soon, I think, is probably... Uh, not in the cards, uh, but but uh, we we follow the we follow the science, and if things get to a point where uh, those things seem reasonable, uh, then it'd be reasonable. But but just my gut level is that uh, uh, there's a reason people have canceled the events in June and July, and I think that's a reasonable assumption that that uh, um, we still are concerned about large groups of people hanging out with each other and, uh, and spreading a disease that can give us a, uh, a, 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 another spike in numbers and have us sitting here next year at this time talking about the same thing. I think that's exactly right. Thank you, Mark. Now to Stephanie Hoff from WISP Politics. Stephanie? Stephanie Hoff from WISP Politics. Hello. Hi, my question is for Governor Evers. Um, you mentioned that PACT, uh, that includes Wisconsin, among other states, to coordinate how to reopen economies. Um, will the reopening be uniform across Wisconsin? Uh, for example, will Vilas County, that only has a few cases, be allowed to fully reopen until Detroit, which is one of the nation's hotspots, um, can open? What what we're cons what we are consistent on are the things that I talked about before. We're consistent on testing. We're in the massive testing. We need to increase the opportunities for people to be tested. We need more pr protection of equipment. We need contact tracing. We need to be prepared for people that have been identified by the contact tracing to be isolated. Those are the things that all the states have agreed on. We've also agreed on the fact that. The, uh, that the states are not locked into um, uh, the same, uh, same timelines, as you said. Uh, uh, Michigan, it looks a lot, uh, Detroit looks a lot different than 
northern Wisconsin, Detroit looks like a lot different than a lot of places in Wisconsin. So there's, there's no commitment to have those things. But we do have, the important thing is we have industries that span all those, all those uh, states, whether it's individuals in the manufacturing or the supply chain of those manufacturers or the agriculture industry. So we will be able to learn a lot from each other and uh, help us once we do get to the point of uh, uh, reducing the, uh, the, the impositions on people that for safety reasons that we will be in a better position going forward. Thank you, Stephanie. And our final question this afternoon belongs to Dax Dublin Ross from Huffington Post. Dax? And a reminder, star six to unmute your phones. Dax Ross from Huffington Post. All right, then with that, we thank you for joining us for today's media briefing. Please continue to monitor the DHS outbreaks and investigations and COVID-19 web pages for information, data, and guidance. For topics not related to public health, visit the websites of the Governor, Wisconsin Emergency Management, the Department of Workforce Development, and the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Thank you and have a good afternoon.